in Asia, particularly in the nation of China or Japan or Korea, there is a famous children's story. It's a story about green frogs. There's a mommy frog and son frog. They live together, but every time the mother frog will tell her son to do something, this frog will always do opposite way. Whatever the mom says, go to mountain, then he will go to the river. Go to the west, then he will go to the east. Whatever the mommy says, the son frog will always do the opposite. The mother frog got sick and she was dying and on the deathbed, she called the son and said to him, my son, I'm dying and when I'm dead, take my body to the stream, nearby the stream and bury me. Because she knew whatever she tells him, he's going to do opposite. So she was thinking that her son will take her body to the mountain and bury her. And that's why she told him to bury her body nearby the stream. But this boy, this frog, once in his lifetime, he repented of his disobedience and rebellion. So he decided to do for the first time in his life, exactly what the mother told him. So he took the body of the mother and buried it nearby the stream. So that's why the story goes on. Every time there's a rain, during the rainy season, these green frogs nearby the trees and nearby the streams were Frog, 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 cry. Is that how the frog cries? At least the Korean frogs cried out like that. No. <laughs> you know, as a children, oftentimes we become disobedient that we are rebellious against our parents. But at their deathbed, their dying wish we try to obey and carry it for the rest of our lives. What if Jesus gave us last dying wish? But we know that Jesus died, but he resurrected and ascended into heaven. But before he ascended into heaven, he gave us last will, last wish for his followers and for his disciples. And as we begin New Year, year 2015, we want to revisit this great commission that Jesus has given us as his last will. It is a symbol to make a disciples of all nations. And we want to take us to book of Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, and examine this great commission again and apply it to year 2015. Intentionally, we want to give our life so that God can disciple us and also we can dis- make a disciples of others. So let's uh, turn our Bible to book of Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18 through 20. Let us all read it together. Begin. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Before he ascended into heaven, on the mountain Olive, he gave this commission to his disciples. So before we talk about further on Great Commission, all of us know and are familiar with the Great Commission. And if we grew up from church during the Sunday school times, we have memorized these verses. 
But let's ask this question before we go on further. In recent years, have you been making disciples? Was there any one person in your life recently, last year, year 2014, or in previous years, you intentionally made a disciples of Jesus over a certain individual or over a nation? Have you spent the time? Did you get together with a brother or sister at a meal together? Share the God's word and your life together and intentionally mentor that person so that that person may grow up to be the disciple of Jesus Christ. If you haven't, that means you are not yet a disciple of Jesus. If we are fully discipled and we fully understand this great commission, we will spend the time, we will give our life to make a disciples of others and all the nations. But if I haven't invested my time and my resources for other people so that they may become disciples of Jesus, that means I'm not a yet a disciple. I need to be continually discipled. There are many, many Christians out in the world. There are many, many people who are saved by grace, so they have obtained the eternal life. That doesn't mean all of my disciples. Even during Jesus' public ministry, there were multiple people who followed Jesus, and Jesus had, had a compassion over these people. He preached the gospel to them, he taught his truth, and also he healed them, and he made, he delivered the demons out of these people so that they can be freed. That doesn't mean until the end, all these people followed Jesus and become, became disciples of Jesus Christ. No. A lot of them left when he began to talk about serious spiritual matters. They couldn't understand. They couldn't take it. So they left. They were ministered and blessed by Jesus. However, they did not become disciples of Jesus Christ. In today's Christendom, our condition is a similar way. There are many, many churchgoers. There are many, many people who confess they believe in Jesus and they are certain when they die, they go to, to heaven. But that doesn't mean they are all disciples of Jesus Christ. It's the same with our congregation in our ministry as well. I've been hearing a lot in recent years from our EM members. EM ministry has been existing last 13 or 14 years. But one thing we've been lacking over the years has been discipleship. It's been discipleship that's been lacking. But instead of we talk about constantly, year after year, I need to be discipled. We need a discipleship. Why don't we change the course and be discipled and continually make a disciples? May this the year be the year to be discipled to make disciples. Let this year be the turning point so that we be discipled to make disciples. And that's why even though it's the very first Sunday of the year that we want to go to Great Commission and re-examine what Jesus meant when he said before he ascended into heaven to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you until the end. And let's observe this command and take it into our heart and apply it to our year 2015 and to our daily living. Now, before we go into detail for this commission, it says, make a disciples of all nations. That is one active verb. 
in this long sentence, there's only one single active verb that is not going, that is not baptizing, that is not teaching. It's making. Make disciples of all nations. To make disciples, what you need to do, there are three participles. One is going, second is baptizing, and third is teaching. By going, by baptizing, by teaching, make all nations disciples of Jesus Christ. That's exactly what Jesus meant. But before we go on further, let's examine Jesus, his style, because that's exactly what he has done. This commission was given to his disciples. How did Jesus make disciples? One very important aspect that we must realize, this great commission was given to the people. We need a people to be discipled. We need a people to make a disciple. God uses the people to make a disciples of Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, the people think, I believe in God. I have an indwelling Holy Spirit. I don't need a person. People are imperfect. Jesus was perfect. I don't need an imperfect people. So that's why people don't make a commitment to one another. So that's why people are not being discipled. Because they are prideful and they are not humble enough to submit their life to human leadership, to mentorship, to disciples. And that's why in our life, as the year continues on, we are not being mentored, we are not being discipled so that we don't make others disciples because we are not yet disciples. Jesus gave this commission to the people. And we must realize when he was making disciples of 12, later one was missing because he betrayed, but we know soon they added one more. So there were always 12 disciples. But one thing we must realize, Jesus was not only son of God, but he was a perfect man. Jesus, a person, made other persons disciples of God. Jesus Christ. That fact, we must be, have to, we have to understand and embrace it. Embrace it. So let me ask you this question. Another question. In your life thus far, who has shaped your spirituality? You come to church on Sundays. You believe in Jesus. Thus far, your color of your faith, your spirituality, your commitment, your walk with Jesus, who has influenced your life? So today's spirituality has been shaped by certain people. If you cannot think of any other people other than far distance a pastor, then you are not truly discipled yet. Because it takes people to make a disciples. For me, my spirituality has been shaped by three men in my life. These are three men greatly influenced my life and my faith in Christ Jesus. First, of course, is Pastor Kim. I rarely spend the time in an intimate way, but because he showed the way as a Christian should live, in such a transparent and such committed ways, by watching him, by observing his lifestyle, it greatly influenced me. So I'm not ashamed to call that he was my disciple. He has patterned my Christian walk in my life. He taught me what the world mission is about. He taught me how to be a servant of God. Surrendering my own right for the sake of the gospel. The only time before he retired that I had a private meal with him was when I proposed to my wife and I was getting married. He was so excited because I was 39 years old, Chandosa. He was concerned whether I was going to get married or not. So he wanted to have a breakfast with me and my future wife. Other than that, not much of private time. 
Because Western mentality is that to make a disciples, bring the people in the classroom and let's go over some curriculum and manual. Yes, it's needed. We do have that program. We will create that. But more than that, it's a sharing life. Because the Bible says, iron sharpens an iron. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 27, verse 17, it says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So he has been great influence to my spirituality. Another man is Missionary King or Danny, Pastor Elder Daniel King. For 20 years, he taught me the Bible. We ministered together, went to mission field together. He taught me how to make others disciples. I was discipled by him. Third man that greatly influenced my spirituality is Pastor Han. He's a such good shepherd, such soft, gentle, reconciler. Everywhere he goes, he brings the joy of Jesus Christ to other people. And he teaches me how to be a, a better pastor. What about us, all of us? Look at our life. Other than our parents, who has shaped your spirituality? Who have you allowed in your life to intervene, to touch, to rebuke, to edify, to challenge, to sharpen your countenance? If you haven't, I'm sorry to say, most likely, either you are frightened because it's a risky business. One thing that is different between Jesus and ourselves, Jesus was a perfect man and perfect God. He made no mistake. He had no flaw. He had no shortcomings. But us, we are different. We are imperfect. We do have a shortcomings. We do have a flaw. If you are looking for a perfect disciple, I'm sorry to tell you, you will never find one. If you find that perfect disciple, please tell me. Because all these three men who have shaped my spirituality, they are great men of God, but they had a many, many flaws, negative sides, made many, many mistakes. They even hurt me. They're far from perfectness. It's a risky business. But I submit my life to be mentored, to be shaped, to be discipled because Jesus also taught us to forgive other people. As we mature, as we grow up more and more, we learn to forgive even our leaders instead of being offended and stumble and run away from them. If I have not allowed any person in my life to touch me, to intervene, either I am very insecure and frightened or I'm very prideful. Even though it is a risky, but it's, it's all worth it. Because the gospel is all about people. Gospel is all about people business. Because the only thing we're going to take into heaven will be people whom we evangelized, will be people whom we ministered so that their faith may grow in Christ Jesus. That's the only thing we are able to take into heaven other than that. No diploma, no house, no car, no money, no wife, no children. There'll be only brothers and sisters in heaven. It's about people. Allowing people into my life and going into the lives of other people. That's how discipleship is taken. It requires men and women to be discipled, to make a disciple. Because we are living in America. American mentality is very private and individualistic. We cannot allow other people to come and talk about our privacy, about our children, about our marriage, about our dream, about our pursuit. There's always a boundary. And that's why we say this. 
mind your own business. None of your business. We are very familiar with these confessions, but not with Jesus. Not with the disciples of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said in the book of Mark, chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, when he called his 12 disciples, book of Mark, chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, then he appointed the 12 that they might be with him. He called the 12 disciples so that they can be with him. Spend the time, spend the life, eat together. Go to bathroom together, laugh together, cry together, rejoice together, serve together, preach the gospel together, cast the demons out together. It's all about sharing lives. So if I don't allow myself and invite other person that can disciple me, I will never be discipled. I'll be a loner. I can volunteer and serve the church, but my growth will be hindered. And having said that, as we examine Jesus' style again, so he requires a man to make a disciples. How has it been done? Jesus shared his life. Let's remember that. We have to share our lives. The reason why during my preaching, not like Typical preachers, I share my personal testimony is because I cannot spend every one of us in private time. So as much as possible, with my flaws, with my victories in Christ Jesus, I want to be transparent and share my testimony. That by sharing lives together, we can sharpen each one's countenance. Because Pastor Kim was so transparent it impacted my life so much. We need to share our lives together. Secondly, we need to share our time together. Sometimes I get perplexed because we say we need a discipleship, but we are not willing to give time to each other. It's impossible without giving time to each other. But in reality, 24 hours a day, we spend eight hours at a job, typically, six to eight hours sleeping, three to four hours preparing or eating food, and average Americans spend five hours of media on screen. But we have a hard time giving more than two hours per week to the Lord and for the sake of being discipled and make us disciples. We are so stingy with our time. There are 168 hours per week. If we intentionally give 10% of the weekly hours, our lives will be so much transformed. 17 hours per week intentionally that we make our hours available for the sake of being discipled and to make others disciples and go out of church building and impact our community. There is such a different church will be such a different world. That doesn't mean we're not going to have a fun together. The difference between joy and fun is joy is a sustaining. Fun is a temporal and leaves us with the emptiness. But joy is when we get together intentional and have a Jesus in the center of our fellowship. The newcomer's ministry who is preparing the bowling night is intentional. It's not just about bowling. It's about helping newcomers to be invited to our community and build up. Jesus has entered the bowling night. Can you invite me? <laughs> My average used to be 250. I created a a tournament during my college years. First tournament I created with my friends and with the average of 215, I got a, a trophy. <laughs> and I was uh, very blamed by others. But We need to give time to each other. And thirdly, the world has to be taught. 
We need to learn God's word. Let God's word be applied to our daily living, every aspect of our life. And also, fourthly, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about about Holy Spirit later on. But lastly, it has to be Jesus-centered. Unless we have a Jesus-centered in our fellowship, it's social club. I'm sorry to say it's a social club. Just because you are meeting inside of church building, do you think that is fellowship? No. If Jesus is missing, if Jesus is not edified, if we do not edify one another, if we do not exalt Jesus in the midst of our gathering, it's a social club. And there are many, many social clubs out in the world. Why do we need to create it inside a church? That's not what we need. Maybe our flesh desires it, but not what Jesus desires in the midst of it. Again, that doesn't mean we're not going to have fun. When we truly have a Jesus centered in the midst of us, there will be a perpetual joy of the Lord. Now let's look at the Great Commission. As we realize how Jesus made his disciples. And he also gave us this commission. By going, by baptizing, by teaching, make disciples of all nations. First, by going. Between going and baptizing, there has to be evangelism. God called his, Jesus called his disciples, they were fishers. But he said, now on, I will make you fishers of men. That's very intentional. The reason why he called us to be his disciples is so that we can catch men and women. So that we can preach the gospel. Between going and baptizing, there has to be certain segment where we share the message of Jesus Christ. So that lost souls be won for the kingdom of God. But reality is, in American church, this is a statistic. 95% of all Christians have never won a soul to Christ. 95% of all Christians never once in their life have led a sinner to Christ. That's reality. 80% of all Christians do not consistently witness for Christ. Less than 2% are involved in the ministry of evangelism. 71% do not give it towards the financing of Great Commission. And also, the denomination statistic. 63% of leadership in this denomination, including deacons and elders, have not led one stranger to Jesus in the last two years through the method of Goyi evangelism. In other words, just going to stranger, anyone who does not know Jesus, Flat out sharing the gospel and leading that person into Christ. 63% of all the leaders last two years have not led a person into Christ. 49% of leadership ministries spend zero time in average week ministering outside of the church. This is the second point. I was so convicted because I was one of them. Almost 50% of leadership ministries spend zero time in an average week ministering outside of the church. It's all about us inside a church building. When the world, every second, thousands, thousands of people are perishing into hell, but all we do is inside a church building and leaders included. Year 2013, we had a ministry called Here and Now. We went out to the neighbors. Five to six hundred people accepted Christ as a Savior. 2014, I, for with some reasons, I stopped. And looking back 2014, we had an absolutely zero ministry that ministered outside the church building, except during the summertime. And also, Crittenton, we gave them gifts. Other than that, Absolutely zero ministry for the sake of salvation of the lost soul. Unless we become intentional, we lose a sight. So easily, we lose a sight. 
And that's why in this year, during the springtime, we are going to come up with an evangelism training course, inviting the people to come be trained so that not only when we go to India and other nations that we preach the gospel, but locally here at our job, in our family, and with our friends, whenever God gives opportunity, we are able to share the gospel. And we need to be trained. We don't want to be one of 95%. Not only that, God has asked us, ask of me for all the nations. I will give them to you as an inheritance. Our church, we have asked for nations. Korean-speaking congregation has proven that promise is right and truthful. And why not us as an English-speaking congregation? Because we can go anywhere. English is accepted in almost every single country in the world. And why not ask for nations? Psalm 2, 18 says, Ask for me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. And I shared this with you during the year end of service. But I want to re-emphasize this again. Because when we say and try to ask the nations before the Lord, Oh, I'm so mere Woman, I'm just a lay person. No, just like a Gail McWilliams said, let's not believe in our excuses, but let's believe in God's promises. Ask nations and He will give them to us. Because in the eyes of God, nations is a small drop in a bucket. Book of Isaiah chapter 40 verse 15, it says, Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. To the eyes of God, all these nations, UN probably categorized about 196 countries in the world, but there are some other, so over 200 nations in the world. To the eyes of God, it's a single drop in a bucket. But God has given us more than single drop in a bucket in our life. Jesus Christ himself, and then many, many blessings we have received. Why not ask God for a drop in a bucket? In Christ's name. And we have so many venues out in the field. During summertime this year, I challenge you, at least go out once in a year. We have 59 nations where our missionaries reside. Soon, Stephen Beck and Olga, they'll be commissioned to go to Russia again as a missionary. Argentina is open, Kenya is open, India is open, Israel is open, Russia is open, Laos, they're asking us, Myanmar is asking us, all the nations, why not go? Make a decision. The question we should ask is not, God, are you sending me? Am I to go? Because the going is already there. The right question that we need to ask is, do I need to stay? That's the question. The reason why I'm staying in America is because God said, you are missionary to this nation. That's why I'm praying for California. I'm praying for this nation. And that doesn't prevent me going to other nations. We can go. As we sing. Secondly, baptizing. Baptizing means not only we are being baptized in the water by confessing Jesus is the Lord, but also he meant being filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized by the Holy Spirit. Because in the book of Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, John the Baptist said it this way. Book of Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with the water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sanders I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus came to earth not to baptize us with the water, but to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. During his stay on earth, He did not baptize other people with the water. In the book of John, chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, when we read it, his disciples baptized others into water, but Jesus himself did not 
baptized with the water. Until he ascended into heaven and sent the promise of the Father, and that is the Holy Spirit. So we need to have a venue so that people can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We filled continually with the Holy Spirit because a Christian life is impossible apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. With my own will, with my own determination, we cannot survive in this world. We cannot serve other people. We cannot minister His church. We cannot prohibit the temptation of this world unless we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The reason why people become burnt out, the reason why ministry and serving become heavy upon their shoulders is because they are de-energized spiritually. So we need to be charged again continually, just like rechargeable battery. Holy Spirit, once it comes in, will never leave us, but we need to be refilled and filled. And we want to create that venue. And that's why we are going to come up with a Friday night prayer worship, with a praise, with a little bit of message. But we want to spend some time with a prayer. Why? Because why, how do we be filled with the Holy Spirit? When we read the book of Acts, there were three ways people were filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. First, when the disciples, 120 of them, got together in a one room, upper room, and prayed together in one accord, and Holy Spirit fell upon them. When the people of God Christians get together is with a one mind, pray together, will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And secondly, when people preach the gospel, truth, Holy Spirit fell upon them. Peter was asked to come to the house of Cornelius, and as he was speaking the truth, Holy Spirit fell upon the household entirely, and they began to speak in tongues and were filled with the Holy Spirit. Third way, that's the most common way to receive a filling of the Holy Spirit is for the disciples laying their hands upon the people. That's how they receive filling of the Holy Spirit. Even Saul, on the way of Damascus to persecute the church, was captured by the lightning of Jesus appearing on the road. He became blinded temporarily. But there was in Damascus a disciple called Ananias. And during the prayer time, the Holy Spirit convicted him that there will be men who is a Saul and they will come to you and lay your hand upon him. And Ananias was afraid. I heard about his rumor. He is a persecutor. No, I have a special mission for him. So Saul comes to Ananias. Ananias lays his hands upon Saul and scales from his eyes were removed and was filled with the Holy Spirit. When Philip, the deacon, went to Samaria to preach the gospel, many, many Samaritans accepted Christ as a Savior. Hearing that news, the church in Jerusalem sent Peter and John. And they went, and they saw the people. And in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 17, it says, and then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Even cell leaders with the cell members, when we become weary, when we become spiritually dry, we can come on Fridays, get together and pray and be filled with the Holy Spirit and we energize. Apostle Paul in the church of Ephesus, there were 12 disciples not yet filled with the Holy Spirit. He also in the book of Acts chapter 19, verse 6, he laid hands on them and they, Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with the tongues and prophesied. So as a ministry, we want to help us to be continually be discipled by going and by baptizing and lastly, by teaching. It's not only pastors have a responsibility to teach others. Any disciple of Jesus, because they learned the word of God, because they were taught, they can teach other people. So this year with our cell leaders, I intentionally want to help them to teach 
other people. During the cell meeting, not only they just host, facilitate, but they be able to teach the word of God. By teaching, you learn more and more. So my encouragement this year to you is, where do you want to spend your time? 168 hours per week. We spend these hours for our own necessities. But why not give a certain hours for the sake of being discipled and to make a disciples of Jesus Christ? And this discipleship never happened with a crowd, with a multitude. On Sundays, yes, from this pulpit, the word of God will be preached and be taught. But that is just one segment. Discipleship always happened in a smaller group. Jesus only left 12 disciples when he ascended into heaven. Nothing else. Multitude, the crowd were gone. Only 12 of them remained. But these 12 disciples turned the world upside down. And that was his strategy. I challenge you to come to cell meeting. Our cell leaders are not perfect. But come, worship together, share life together, give time to each other. Let's sharpen our faces together. Encourage one another. Be intentional. Be discipled to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's rise up. Can we ask God that this is a prayer? Lord, would you allow a person in my life to disciple me? And as I am being discipled, would you send a, a person and people and nations so that I can disciple them as well? So this world may be full of Disciples of Jesus Christ, carrying the presence of God and resembling likeness of Jesus Christ to this broken and dark world. Then we'll be salt and light, transforming the world. Life is so short. As we want to cry out the name of Jesus three times and ask God, Lord, this year, let me be discipled. And also help me to make others disciples of Jesus Christ. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father, we thank you.